Good morning and welcome to worship here at Trinity United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Jeff and I'm glad that you are here with us this morning. I hope that you have been coming the last couple of weeks because we are in a series right now on encountering the presence of Jesus, looking at it through the lens of Luke chapter 24. And we've been looking at four different ways that two of Jesus' disciples encountered the presence of God in powerful ways. They encountered Jesus' presence, as we looked at last week, through the people of God. This week we'll look at how a walk with God reveals the presence of God. And in the coming weeks we'll also look at how the Word of God and the fire of God reveal to us the presence of God. But today, join us as we look at Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet, to see what Jeremiah has to say about walking, within, walking in God's ways. For our announcements this morning, I want to remind you that Dr. Drew Harvey is starting up a Bible study on September 1st, and I've been calling it Disciple 3 this whole time. He reminded me this week, it's Disciple 2, and it's going to be on Genesis and Exodus, where we'll be taking an intensive look into those first two books of the Bible. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to join us on Zoom, 7 p.m. September 1st, and there is a book here at the church which you can pick up. Uh, to follow along with, please contact the church office or Drew if you have questions on how to join. Also, we have, uh, as I announced last week, our weekday school, uh, Trinity's Preschool, has made the decision to delay its opening until at least January of 2021. And there's a lot of factors that went into that decision. Uh, we're very saddened by it, but that, that is where we are at for right now. And so 
Uh, please be in prayer for our preschool. Please be in prayer for students as they return to whatever schools they're going to. And just be in prayer for the world right now. It, it's uh, Everything is kind of up in the air as far as we know. Uh, another announcement that I have is that we have church council on August 24th at 7.30 p.m. That also will be on Zoom. And our district has scheduled Trinity's church conference for Wednesday, October 21st at 7 p.m. at First United Methodist Church in Washington. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your presence among us. Lord, may we experience your presence in a variety of ways, whether it be through your word, through a walk with you, through your people, or through your fire. May we feel your presence this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, for our children's message this morning, I want to show you one of the first tricks that I ever learned. It's one of my favorites. It is a classic of magic called the Cut and Restored Rope Trick. Here are the instructions. I want to walk you through these step by step, hoping that I can remember them all so that I can show you this wonderful trick. Step number one, you get a piece of rope and a pair of scissors. Simple enough. Step number two, find the center of the rope. Step number three, cut the rope at the center. Now, according to the instructions, this should leave me with two separate and e equal, wait, all right, they're not quite equal, are they? Um, I must have done something wrong. Do you mind if I start over at the beginning? Let me start this over one more time. Let me go back, let's see. All right, you start off with one big long piece of rope and then let's see. So I've got one piece of rope, I've got to find the center of that rope, there we go. Find the scissors, cut the rope at the center. Once again, according to the instructions, this should leave us with two separate and equal. There we go. Let me trim those up a bit here. All right, it's very good. Equal pieces of rope, and then I think I lost my place again. I really should know this trick better than that. Boys and girls, do you mind if I start over once more? Let me just start at the beginning one more time. All right. You start off with one big, long piece of rope. You get the scissors. Find the center. Oh, that's right. That's right. I've got to find the center of the rope. Let me try it. Let me try just doing this. All right. I'm going to do this. And you shout through your TV. Tell me when to stop whenever you think I'm near the middle. All right. Whenever you think I'm ready at the middle, you just shout stop. Right there? Right about there? Okay. Let me cut it right there. And let's, oh, we're still not at the middle. Um, hmm. Boy, this isn't really working at all, is it, boys and girls? I'll tell you what, do you mind if I start over just one more time? Let me start over once more, uh, and then, you know what, boys and girls, I don't really know how this trick works. Hopefully, I'll be able to figure it out for you another time. In the meantime, let me just talk to you about this for a moment. The rope trick doesn't seem to work right, so we just start over again. Start over again. Every time I mess up, we just start over again. It's nice to have do-overs, isn't it? Sometimes in life we get those do-overs. If we're working on a paper or a project and we color outside of the lines or we make a mistake, sometimes the teacher or our parents or just we ourselves will just go get a new sheet of paper and we'll just start all over again from the beginning. But other times life doesn't work like that. Sometimes we make mistakes or we do things that are wrong and we can't just simply start all over again we have to deal with what are called consequences to our actions. And that's where smart choices come in. We can have better consequences if we make better choices. But there are also times where we try our best and we still make a bad choice or we learn a lesson. And that's where we look for something that God teaches called grace. You see, God's grace is something that God offers to us to forgive us for our sins when we confess our sins and ask Jesus to forgive us. And when we do, it's like God gives us a do-over. God helps us to start over again when we turn to Jesus and pray and ask for his grace. So when you make mistakes, try to do better. But when you mess up, as we all do, go to God and ask for forgiveness. And Jesus will give that to you. Let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, we thank you that when we make mistakes, that you are there to forgive us and to help us to make better choices next time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us now in our congregational singing. These songs are used with permission from the publisher under our CCLI license number 1563629 and our CVLI license number 504264808. Oh, no. 
for our pastoral prayer time, what a privilege it is to be able to go to the Lord in prayer, whether it's a praise that we want to share or a prayer that we want to pray. God hears us. And I invite you now to enter into a spirit of prayer. And if you have a prayer request or a praise that you'd like to share with the community, please type it into your Facebook chat line and make sure that it's not something that is confidential in nature. But if you would like to share it with the community, you're welcome to do so. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, as we gather together today, Lord, we give you thanks for the spirit of Jesus which connects us, whether it's over airwaves or over a Wi-Fi signal or through a TV screen, a tablet or a laptop or a phone screen. Lord, you are here. You are present. And we rejoice in that. Lord, we pray today for the world that we live in. We know that it's kind of a mess right now. We know that uh, 2020 has not been a very good year in so many ways. And yet, we believe that you are faithful. We believe that you are acting in new and different ways to call us to repentance, to call us to faithfulness, to call us to stop relying on ourselves and on some of the things that we maybe put our trust in before, and instead to rely on you to turn our hearts to you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to do that. We pray that you would help us to find a cure. We pray that you would help us to find not only a cure for coronavirus, but also a cure for division, a cure for systemic racism, a cure for injustice everywhere, a cure for whatever it is that is troubling us as a nation, as a community, as individuals, Lord, we need you, and we turn to you in this time, praying in the name of Jesus, as you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Jeremiah and will be read for us by Claudia Steele. Please open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 6 and follow along. This is reading from Jeremiah 6, verses 16 through 20. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. I pointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, observe. O witnesses, what will happen to them? Here, O oh, oh earth, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. What do I care about incense from Sheba or sweet calamus from the distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come before your word this morning, Lord, we lift up to you these ancient words. Help us to find the ancient paths, the way that is good, and help us to walk in it as we follow you and where you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever heard the idea that if you die in your dreams, that you'll never wake up? That, that you'll actually die in real life if you die in your dreams at night? I, I've heard that before. I've never tested it. I've never died in one of my dreams, not that I can remember anyway. But, but other people have. Yeah, other people have died in some of my dreams. There have been horrible things that have happened in dreams sometimes. And, and maybe you've experienced this too. You, you have a dream that is so vivid, that is so real, and, and that is so terrible 
that all of a sudden you wake up and your heart is pounding and, and you think to yourself, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe that whatever my mind just told me occurred actually occurred. And, and then you wake up in the middle of the night and you're sweating and, and then there's that moment of terror followed by that moment when you realize it was all just a dream. And then the waves of relief that wash over you as you realize that the consequences of whatever it was that your mind concocted, no matter how terrible they were, that it didn't really happen. That you will wake up in the morning and face a brand new day, a new start, and that it was all a dream. I've had those dreams like that before. Maybe you have as well. And you know that feeling of relief that washes over you. But you know, there's also been times in my life, and I'll bet times in your life too, where it hasn't been a dream. Where terrible things have happened, sometimes based on the decisions that I've made, sometimes based on the decisions of others, or just the state of the world. I mean, how many of us would love to wake up tomorrow and find out that 2020 is just a dream? That there really is no coronavirus, that the death count isn't continuing to be on the news, that the schools are all not really having to deal with the possibility of shutting down, that fall sports might not take place, that jobs haven't been lost, that businesses haven't had to close. Uh, so many different things that we look at 2020 and we wish that it was just a dream, but it, it's not. It's a reality. And, and there are other things in our lives that's, that we face, that we, we sometimes come to a crossroads and we have a decision to make and, and we, we wonder if we, if we make the wrong decision, what are the consequences of that decision going to be? And can we wake up and find that it was all just a dream? Or do we stand at that crossroads and have to really make a determination, make a decision and wonder which way is this decision going to lead me? What is going to be the best decision that I can make right now? And what do I do when I can't fix what has already been broken? What do I do? How do I proceed in life when I don't know which way to go? You know, we're going to be looking today at a story in Jeremiah that dealt with some terrible terrible problems going on in the people of Israel and or the people of Judah. And I'm going to tie that together with the study that we're currently in from Luke chapter 24, where Jesus is on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. And he appears to two of his disciples and he shows them the truth about his presence, even when they didn't quite recognize him. And as we look at that today, I want to shed some light on that passage through the lens of Jeremiah. And I do believe that they connect. And here's why I believe that they connect. Jeremiah was what you would call a doomsday prophet. For Jeremiah, the end was near. He would have been one with a sandwich board on saying, repent or die. Jeremiah spent years and years telling the people of Judah to turn from their wicked ways, to walk in the ways of God, or destruction would come. The people didn't listen. The people turned away. The people refused to hear the warnings. And as a result, Jeremiah's prophetic words came true. God turned God's back on the people of Israel. God allowed the Babylonian armies to come sweeping through Jerusalem, sack the city, tear down the temple, cart off all of the, or many of the people to exile in Babylon. And the, the, the experience for the people of Judah was terrible. It was one of the worst experiences that the people of Judah had ever had to endure in their lives as they watched their beloved city, their beloved temple, everything that they knew be destroyed and felt the hand of God lift from them as God's chosen people. Incredibly destructive. Now, how I tie that together with Jesus is we're looking at the incredible destruction of the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, 
When Jesus came into the world, he was known as Emmanuel, God with us. And, and Jesus became the presence of God manifest in the world, which is what the ancient Israelites and people of Judah believed the temple was supposed to represent. God's presence, the Ark of the Covenant, it was housed in the temple in Jerusalem. That temple was destroyed in 586 BC, and that's what Jeremiah was referring to here. Centuries later, Jesus comes along. The temple has been rebuilt. There was another temple known as Herod's Temple, and that was the one that was in place in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And Jesus came in and cleansed that temple, turned over the tables, drove out the money changers, etc. And the people were accusing him, saying, what, by what authority do you have to do this? And in John chapter 2, we see this in verse 18. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now the Jewish people thought that he was talking about the temple, which had been destroyed back in 586 BC and which they had rebuilt. And it took them generations to rebuild it. And here Jesus is saying, I'll rebuild this in three days. They didn't realize. Jesus wasn't talking about the, the stones and the physical temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about himself as the temple. And we know that they tried to destroy that temple on the cross. And in three days, Jesus restored it. Jesus rebuilt it. God raised Jesus from the dead. And, and so here we see Jeremiah's prophecies about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem connected with Jesus as the, the temple of God, the presence of God back in Jerusalem again. And Jesus saying, you might try to destroy this temple, but I will rebuild it. So we have both of these things, momentous occasions in the life of the people of Judah. The second one, more so for Christians, uh, but the, the connection is there. The connection is there. And so let's take a look at what happened in Jeremiah's day. In Jeremiah's day, we come to these words. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said we will not walk in it. And, and Jeremiah goes on to say, look, take time to turn back to God. And, and every time the people don't listen, the people don't listen, they refuse to listen. So what does all this have to do with where we're at right now? I, I want to try to make this a connection point because many people are standing at a crossroads in life right now. Maybe you're at a crossroads in life. COVID has created a lot of decision points for many of us. COVID has caused many people to examine their financial situation and say, do I have enough to get by right now? Should I retire? Uh, should I pivot into a new type of business? Should I do something different with my life? Right now, this is August. This is also the time where many of our high school graduates are going off to college for the first time. We just dropped off Johnny this past week, and this coming week, we're going to be taking Jason to Penn State. And I know many of Trinity's high school graduates are either already getting settled in college, or they will be going soon, or joining the military, or the workforce, or doing something different than what they've been used to. They're at a crossroads. And as they stand at that crossroads, as we all stand at our various crossroads in life, we have decisions to make. Which way will we go? How will we find the presence of God in our lives, even in the midst of all of this change, all of this unsettledness? Where is the presence of Jesus? You know, I believe that we can find it. And I want to take you back to my own childhood with two questions that my parents always asked me whenever I was wanting some freedom. And by freedom, I meant I wanted to go out with friends or I wanted to do something different or be out later than usual. Uh, whenever I asked anything of my parents, they always asked me these two questions. Where are you going and who are you with? And, and if I could provide satisfactory answers to those two questions, they usually let me go. If I was going someplace safe and I was with people that they trusted, it usually wasn't an issue. 
And I've asked the same questions, uh, Karen and I asked the same questions of our children. And that's one of the reasons why I'm sure Jason is so ready to leave because he's tired of having to ask for permission to do things all the time. And he can't wait for that freedom to get off to college and be able to make his own choices. But I hope that he's still guided by those two questions, even as I am guided by those two questions that my parents asked me. And I encourage you in your spiritual journey to continue to be guided by those two questions. In your spiritual journey, in your life, when you stand at the crossroads, when you have a decision to make, ask yourself, where am I going? And who am I going there with? Those questions are just as relevant for adults as they are for kids. Those questions are just as relevant for our spiritual life as they are for our children's social lives. They matter. Where are you going? What does Jeremiah have to say about that? Jeremiah says this, stand at the crossroads. Stop. Stand at the crossroads. Stop for a moment and look. And as we look, we ask the question, where am I now? Think about where you are. You know, this came to light for me in, in a big way this week. And I know it's going to be even more so on Tuesday when we take Jason back to school because I went to Penn State and I graduated from there many, many years ago. It was over 30 years ago that I started my freshman year there at Penn State. And, and as I was going and finding my freedom and everything else, uh, I know that, that Jason is going to experience some of the same things. Now, he'll experience them differently than I did. But some of those rites of passage for a young person leaving the nest of their parents' home and going on their own, those rites of passage take place. And, and as I think about Jason and what he's going to experience, it, it makes me think back to my own time as a young 18, 19 year old kid off to college for the first time, finding my own way, spreading my wings, all that stuff. And it's a time to reflect now. As, a, as an adult, and, and remember that kid that I was so long ago, and those dreams that I had and everything else, and, and to reflect for a moment and say, well, whatever happened to my life? Did the stuff that I wanted to do when I was 18, 19 years old, did that come to pass? Am I who I wanted to be back then? Who am I right now? Maybe you ask yourself those questions sometimes too. Maybe it's not because you sent a kid off to college. Maybe it's because you've had a review on your job that didn't go so well. Or maybe it's because uh, you've had to shift or pivot your job because of COVID or something else. Or maybe you've had a health crisis or in some way been introduced to your own mortality. And you've wondered, where am I in life? Jeremiah says, stop. Stand at the crossroads. Stop and think about where you are. And then once you've done that, go to the next phase of that question, which is look. Look around and think about where you want to be. As we think about where you're going in life, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? And, and is what you thought 30 years ago, or however many years ago for yourself, when you were an idealistic young person, and you thought of who you wanted to be someday, is that who you are? Is where you are where you want to be? Are you who you want to be? And as you consider those things, I hope the answer is yes. I mean, that would be great. If, if your life is what you hoped it would be and that's where you are, that's wonderful. If it isn't, then maybe you need to look at it differently. Uh, maybe you need to examine yourself. Uh, let's talk for a moment about a midlife crisis. Midlife crisis is defined in this way. It is a transition of identity and self-confidence that can occur in middle-aged individuals, usually between 35 and 55 years of age. And the phenomenon is described as a psychological crisis brought about by events that highlight a person's growing age, inevitable mortality, and possibly lack of accomplishments in life. And as a result of that, uh, there can be lifestyle changes that take place or people can process that in different ways. It was a phrase that was coined by Elliot Jock in 1965, this idea of a midlife crisis. Uh, thankfully, I'm not going through one, at least not yet. 
Although I've got a few more years till I hit 55, so maybe I'll experience one someday. But the idea of a midlife crisis, I think it applies to, to this idea. If, if where we want to be is not where we are in life, then that creates this cognitive dissonance. That creates this opportunity for crisis to try to figure out, well, what do I want in life? And how do I figure out how to get it? Because that's really the third part, right? So we stand at the crossroads, stop. And then we look and we, we've asked the question, where am I now? Where do I want to be? And then that third question is to listen and to walk in God's way to get there. If you're not where you want to be in life, then you can get there. That's the good news. God has a path for you. God has a path for all of us. And we can walk in that path. And if you haven't walked in that path up until now, here's the good news. You can start today. You can start today. You can turn your life around one day at a time, one step at a time. And, and here's what I want you to remember. These two questions, right? Where are you going and who are you with? They lead us to this next question of, of who are you with? And when we ask the question, who are you with? I want you to think for a moment about the people in your life. The people in your life that matter. The people in your life that are, are with you on this journey of life. Where are they leading you? Where are they leading you? Are they leading you to a better path? Are they leading you to places that draw you closer to God? And I especially ask this question of our young people. I think of my son, Jason. I think of our other graduates and people from Trinity who are going off to school. It is so vitally important that you choose the right friends. It is so incredibly important that you follow people who are going to lead you where you want to go in life, not to places that will take you away from your goals. And, and so think about where you want to go. Think about where you are and how you're going to get from where you are to where you want to be, and then think about who's going to help take you to that place. Choose your friends wisely. And as I said before, be a wise choice, because there's another side of this equation. It's not just about the people you're with and where they are leading you. It's also about who you are and where you're leading them. What direction are you leading the people that are following you? Are you living as an example of Jesus? Are you living as someone who lifts others up? Or are you living as someone who tears others down? Are you living as an example of who God wants you to be? Are you walking in the path that Jesus would have you to walk? And then the third question, really, whether you're leading them or they're leading you, the real question, and the one that matters the most is this one, what direction is God leading us? Because really, we're all in this together, aren't we? We're all in this journey together, and are we leading each other on a pathway that leads closer to Jesus? The key theme that I want to talk about today, and I'm just getting to it now, is this. Future consequences cannot change prior decisions, but prior decisions can change future consequences. Think about that for a moment. I know that's deep. It might sound kind of obvious, but it is a deep thought as well. Future consequences cannot change prior decisions. All right, as much as Jeremiah spoke to the people of Judah and, and said, look, if you don't change, this is what's going to happen. And then once they didn't change, the, the, the wheels were already in motion. The, the, the people of Judah had reached a tipping point where their sinful behaviors, their idolatry, it had stacked up so much weight that it reached a tipping point and, and it was too late to turn back. It was too late to change the outcome of what was happening. And so we see the tragedy of it in verse 19 of Jeremiah 6. Here, O earth, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. They didn't do what they should have done. They didn't follow God's ways. They couldn't change the consequences that they had to deal with because of their decisions. It doesn't work that way. But had they made better decisions, those decisions could have impacted their future consequences. 
And so now, especially young people, I want to speak this to you, young people especially, you stand at a crossroads. You, I hope, haven't made all of the foolish, stupid choices that lead to consequences that you don't want to deal with later in life. You're at a place where you can choose the good path, where you can choose the ancient paths that lead to life, not to death. And we find that path when we walk with Jesus. You see, Jesus died for your sins. Jesus knew that you would mess up. Jesus knew that you would have struggles. But Jesus also knew that your heart would want to cry out for hope, that you don't want to be left in despair, that you don't want to be left in devastation. You want to find the way to life. And God offers that way through walking with Jesus. And you can make a decision now it will impact your future forever if you turn to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. If you turn to Jesus and say, yes, Lord, I want to follow your ways, not my own. Because even though our future consequences cannot change our prior decisions, our prior decisions can change our future consequences. And if you make the decision today to walk in the ways of Jesus, it will lead to a future that is filled with hope, that is filled with love, that is filled with life, and that is found in Jesus. Will you make that decision today? Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks that you set before us these choices, these pathways. Lord, help us to seek out the ancient paths. Help us to seek out the paths that others have trod, that have led to a life with you. May we make those same choices for ourselves and find our hope in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. For our ministry moments and our time of offering today, I invite you to pray over what the Lord has laid on your heart to give. And to make sure that you give faithfully, either through online giving or through dropping off a check at the church, sending it in the mail. Uh, one of the ministries that I want to highlight this week is our prayer shawl ministry. We have different people in the church uh, that work on these prayer shawls and either knit them or sew them or put them together in some other fashion. This one is a quilted one. And we give these to people who are experiencing health problems, to people who are experiencing loneliness, uh, to anyone who needs to feel that prayers are being lifted up for them. Uh, the people pray as they make these, and then as they are given, we continue to remember those people in prayer. So if you know of someone who is in need of prayer and would like a reminder that they are cared for by Trinity Church, please come and get one of these prayer shawls. We just ask that you let either Kathy Canals, Bev Park, or Mary Agnew know or you can even let Eileen know at the church office if you happen to come by here to pick one up. Because we do like to keep track of who gives them out so that, uh, so that we know what kind of uh, an impact this ministry is having. We also have uh, prayer caps that are available for cancer patients or others who might want to have their head warm. And just to remember that God loves us. That the covering of God is over us and that we are covered in prayer. If you'd like to be a part of this prayer shawl ministry, please see Kathy Knauss. If you'd like to use one of these prayer shawls to give to someone else, uh, they're here available for you to do so. Let's pray. Almighty God, we pray today and we bless these prayer shawls. We give you thanks for the love and the care and the prayers that went into them. And we pray that whoever receives them would feel a blessing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And please take a moment now to reflect on God's blessings in your life and to hear the music of our anthem this morning. Used with permission with CCLI license number 1563629 and CVLI license number 5042648. I want to close today with a special prayer for our graduates, uh, for those that are going off to college or to school or of some other nature or to jobs or whatever. We want to send you forth with a blessing. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for these high school graduates. And Lord, we pray that as they take the next step in their journey of life, that it might also be another step in their journey of faith and that you would help them to walk with you each step of the way. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. about himself after Jesus went in and cleansed the temple same temple that we're talking about well different temple because it had to be rebuilt no it didn't that's an anachronism no it is All right. good morning and welcome to worship well actually I have a question which camera should I look at oh sorry that one look at this one yep. okay we're just testing this one just testing. it's not no. okay. I license number five zero four Two five four eight zero eight. I don't think I got that right. Hold on. The rope. Step number three. Cut the rope at the middle. Now, according to the instructions, I should use better scissors. I think I do need better scissors. These aren't cutting. <laughs> Let's come back to this. <laughs>